Hello, I'm Javier Harkin, and this is Harking Back, a podcast about the pop culture of a lifetime. Whose life? Mine. I'm going back through every year I've been alive and finding out what was going on in that year. This week we're looking at 1984. I was two years old, and I think two years old is the kind of time you really start maybe remembering things? I don't know. I know I was doing things, because this is the time where family photos, you're actually doing things. Like, there's photos of me somewhere, like, blowing bubbles... Uh, there's a photo of me, like, having, like, a bath in a tub, in a sink. I don't know what was going on, but I was in a big tub in a sink, and I looked very happy having my bath in there. Uh, and another one where I'm just kind of, like, on the driveway somewhere in nappies and shoes. And I just find it weird that I was in nappies and shoes. Like, I just went, like, no, 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 no shorts, no trousers, no, let's just go nappy. But shoes, definitely shoes. It looks really weird, and it kind of creeps me out. I don't know why. Uh, 1984, obviously... Honourable mention has to go to the book, 1984, which I wonder if people today think that it was written in 1984, and they're like, oh my god, 1984 was so crazy. Um, If you don't know, 1984, very famous book written by George Orwell in 1949, where he predicted the future, uh, his future, which would have been 1984, it's totally, it's about totality, totality? Totalities. Totalities. You've got to count your totalities like calories. A totalitarianist. Oh, God, I can say this. I can say this. A totalitarian government. I'm an adult. I said it. There we go. Totalitarian government. Uh, and it predicts a lot of things that have happened today. It's a very good book. And I'm sure George Orwell, if he knew the shit that was going on today, he'd, he'd be so pissed. He'd be sitting there going, I wrote the book as a fucking warning, guys. Come on. And I know it was a bestseller. He would be having the best news and then the worst news. He'd be like, oh my god, my book was was a huge global sensation. Amazing. Amazing. So everyone got the warning, right? I saved the future. And we'd be like, no, we, we read it. And all the shit that you said was going to happen, happened. So I'm sorry about that. 1984 is one of those books where it, it's really important. It's got good messages, but you can just read it and enjoy it. It's not... You know, it's one of those books where you can read and people will go, oh, you've read 1984. Well, it was when I was a kid. And it didn't have to be like those, you know, in high school, you get people that are just starting to read books so they can say they've read books. I remember one guy that was like, read Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto just so he could say he'd read it and just so he could wander around saying things like, oh, fucking communism. Yeah, 1984 is not that book. You can read it to be, you get the best of both worlds because it's a good read and you can say you've read it, which people will like and go, oh, a cultured person. Um, and they, but, but not to the extent where people are like, you just read that to be a prick. You know? So 1984, it's very, very good. Check it out if you have not read it. What else happened in 1984? Paul and Linda McCartney are arrested in Barbados for possession of cannabis. How much cannabis? How much did they have on them? How much does a beetle and his wife take on holiday? Uh, They got caught with about half an ounce. Which, I don't know how long they were planning to be on Barbados. Not a huge amount of time, but half an ounce. That's a shitload of weed, right? Right? Like, I remember what an ounce looked like. From pictures I had seen that my friends had shown me. Yeah. Anyway, that was a lot. It was a lot of weed. And to take anyway, um, they could either go to jail or pay a hundred dollar fine. A <laughs> hundred dollars for Sir Paul McCartney. Was he a knight then? I don't know. Anyway, they just would have looked at that and just gone, "Oh shit, oh shit, we could be going to jail." What's the alternative? Hundred bucks? Oh shit, that, take my wallet. He got it. He probably got it out of his fucking wallet, and they just walked out of the courtroom, going, "If I give you another two hundred bucks, can I smoke it?" I don't know. Interesting fact, to the day, January 16th, on the same day, four years ago, Paul McCartney had previously been arrested in Japan for having half a pound of cannabis on him, which was enough for a smuggling charge in Japan. Paul McCartney, at one point, you know, shame, first time, shame on you, second time, shame on, you can't, you can't shame weed twice, that's what I'm saying. 
You know what I'm saying. Paul McCartney got four years on the same day. He likes his weed. He's a fucking beetle. What did you expect? The guys wrote all these songs in a short amount of time. Like, the Beatles were actually active for an incredibly short amount of time. Um, don't quote me on this, but like seven years or something like this. Less than ten. And they just pumped out hit after hit after hit after hit. You don't think they did that without the aid of, of narcotics? They should have been like, yeah, I'm carrying weed. You know, if you let me keep it, I'll write a fucking great song about Barbados and Japan. How about that? Uh, also 1984, Apple releases Macintosh, the PC, the Windows killer. It was great. Do you remember those one machine block Apple Macintoshes? The old ones, the old, old, before they put color on them and they had the, I remember the first time I used it and I was like, there's, the mouse only has one button. What witchcraft is this? Does this computer not good enough to have two buttons? Even back then, Jobs was like, yeah, no, we've got to make this shit simple, man. We've got to get it simple. Apple even funded for a, a Super Bowl ad that was actually based on the novel of 1984. A Super Bowl ad for the Macintosh. And it was directed by Ridley Scott. So they're throwing all the shit at it. Yeah. And it was set in 1984. And it's about um, all these mindless people looking at propaganda on a screen. Very 1984. Apparently, those are the computer users of current day 1984. And then this lady comes through running in athletic gear to, um, you know, stir them. And it's funny because I think these days, Apple users are a bit of a cult. Yeah, if you're listening to this on your iPhone right now and going, not me. Yeah, you are. You are. Anyway, so the athletic lady runs through and she's being chased by guards because she's dangerous. She's got new ideas about PCs. And she runs through and she's holding a sledgehammer. And she gets to the screen where all the people are watching this propaganda and she hurls the sledgehammer at the screen and it smashes and then it says like uh, Apple Macintosh, I guess. Which is which is really apt because she says, haven't we all want to take, haven't we all wanted to throw a sledgehammer through our PCs or our screens or our computers at one point? I do daily. Pretty much any time I have to try and fill out an online form. Oh, my wife, Eddie, any time she sees me she hears me yelling from the office. She's like, are you doing an online form? And I'll be like, yes! These motherfuckers! Ah! Online admin is my kryptonite. It sends me into an absolute rage spiral. I don't know about you guys, but it really does for me. Also, this year, 1984, IBM releases PC DOS version 3.0. Uh, DOS users, any DOS users in the house? Where are my DOS users at? When I was a kid on my dad's PC which I broke many times, I would use DOS and you felt like a hacker because it was all text-based. But I learned how to use it because that's how I learned how to play games. You know, you had to learn how to navigate DOS so you could get to the folder or the directory, as we used to call it back then. And, oh, you felt like a hacker because you'd try to find um, the games folder and then you'd have to, like, search for all the files and you'd be like, hey, DOS, show me all the files. It'd, like, print out, brrr, like a 1980s hacker and you'd find the executable file and type it. And that was your little reward. You got the game after all your hacking. It felt great. I miss it. I miss it so much. Ah, text-based operating systems. Those were the days. Those were the days. Um, Van Halen releases their most successful album. And it's called 1984. Take that, Taylor Swift. 1989. They were doing it back in 84. And they were calling it 84. Uh, this album, of course, has Jump. Probably the most famous song. Oh, my God. I remember... Um, <laughs> I just remember when I was in high school there was a um there were these two guys that were like really cool you know like they're kind of uh they were like the stupid guys the kind of guys that would be pranking and like they would eat anything for a dare and like they've somehow they were like the kings of the school and everyone loved them um and they said one time oh this lunchtime in uh in the hall we're gonna perform uh jump we're gonna do like lip sync jump by Van Halen and everyone was like, oh my god, wow, we're all going to be there. And so everyone piles into the uh, hall at lunchtime to watch these guys. And they've got some of their friends up there pretending to play instruments. And everyone's waiting for the song to start. And then, dun, 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 the start of jump plays. And these guys run down the aisles dressed in like 80s rock gear. And everyone's like, whoa, and they high five and everyone. And they get up on the stage and they start going like, jump. 
And then they realized they had not thought how long the song was because that's when they kind of looked at each other and just realized like, oh, we just stand up here now and just and just sing. And the whole thing just was this glorious kind of slow motion car crash where they just stood there not knowing what to do and suddenly realized how long this fucking song was. And everyone started to look bored and started talking and shuffling their feet. And I was there just going, yes, yes, you don't realize you just had one idea and you didn't think it through. I'm not spiteful or bitter at all. I swear. Fun fact, Jump. The worst song to have on a suicide hotline as waiting music. What else? Where's the Beef? Commercial airs for the first time. That famous, famous Wendy's one. We didn't get Wendy's in New Zealand. I do remember hearing about Where's the Beef. Like this was just a... But uh, was I thinking of What's the Beef? Like what's the beef with the... What's your beef with this guy? Which is always your complaint with someone. But Where's the Beef comes out. I did like Wendy's Burgers. I remember going to the US to visit my cousins on family trips. Um, and like having American burgers. Oh my God, they were amazing. They were shit. And Wendy's, I had those big square patties that came out the sides. Hence Where's the Beef on the other ones. It was good. Madonna, Madonna releases Holiday in 1984. Uh, Michael Jackson was doing an ad for Pepsi in 84. And while they're filming it, a pyrotechnic does... He gets too close or a pyrotechnic malfunctions. Either way, his hair goes on fire for a bit. And it's on fire for about 20 seconds. And then, you know, he's uh, jumped on by every crew member and stuff. And they put out the fire. He gets some scarring on his scalp and everything. Um, You've got to realize... And this is from someone that uses hair product religiously. In the 80s, hair products were basically jet fuel as far as fire is concerned. Like, it was just your head was 500 times more flammable if you used any sort of hair product in the 80s. And Michael Jackson was using something. Even hairspray. Do you remember when you used to... um? The first time you realize that you could use hairspray can as, as a blowtorch and like in, in school and like once someone pull out a lighter and you and you make a flamethrower. That was very fun. Anyway, that's the sort of shit we're talking about. So his hair goes on fire. Um, they put it out. He gets some scarring. Sorry, Michael. Apparently this is what changed his look. I don't know. Some Michael Jackson fans going, no, it's not. Look into the biography. Pepsi paid him $1.5 million to say sorry. Which, to be fair, he donated to a medical center and he founded the Michael Jackson Burn Center for Children. Of course he did. Come on, Michael. Haven't these kids suffered enough? What? <laughs> hey, burn victim. Look who's here to see you. Michael Jackson. Motherfucker. Um, still, you can't keep Michael Jackson down. He, like, he got his head burnt in this commercial. He still won eight Grammys that year. What else? A weird thing I found in my research, just one entry that said, first time eight people are in space. I don't know who was counting how many people were in space. And then later on in the year, I saw something that said, first time 11 people are in space. So people in space was someone's priority that year. That year also, 84, Britain's Torval and Dean get a perfect score in ice skating at the Winter Olympics. A perfect score. Like, what do you, what, what do you do after that? Not just winning gold. I'm assuming they won gold. right? They would have cleaned up. But to get a perfect score. You don't... That's it. You've, you've completed your sport. Not only did you go to the Olympics, you were perfect at the Olympics. The Olympics could not fault you. You've done it. I don't think... you don't, What else do you do? The Winter Olympics. Where white people have a chance. What else? Spitting, um, spitting image debuts. This is a program in the UK that they'll use for uh, satirical purposes. Like they'd um, make puppets of celebrities or politicians and they put them in sketches. And these puppets are nightmare inducing. There's something about them. They're, they're so creepy. They've got this kind of rubbery texture. They, they look like big, uh, you know, they're the kind of puppets where everything's exaggerated. Like, have you ever seen um, the music video for uh, Phil Collins's or Genesis? I forget which one's it. Uh, Land of Confusion. This is the time. This is the place where we look to the future. Not much left to go around. That one. And they use these puppets in that music video. There's something about that. I remember seeing, I don't know why, maybe we got a little bit of this in New Zealand or maybe we got a couple of sketches. Um, but these puppets, 
ugh. Even now, I'm still kind of like, my shoulders go up and I look behind me to see where the fuck they are. They're really creepy. I don't know who made them. Like, you're, they're a work of art, but goddamn, nightmare inducing. What else? Mick Fleetwood of Fleetwood Mac files for bankruptcy. Yeah. That's kind of sad, isn't it? You can go your own way to the bank and file for bankruptcy. How does Fleetwood Mac file for bankruptcy? In the 80s. Like, this was their playground. This was their height, wasn't it? Like, I've never been a, a huge Fleetwood Mac song. Like, I like their songs, but I don't really know anything about the band or what they were up to or anything like that. But I would assume mid-80s, Fleetwood Mac, you're flying high. Surely. Surely. Apparently not. Filed for bankruptcy. I wonder if it's one of those situations where the manager just really fucked them over. You know, like you always hear with boy bands. Like, the manager took all the money and made them work for, like, a dollar a song. And then fucked off. Maybe it's that situation? I don't know. 84. Starlight Express opens in London. Written by Andrew Lloyd Webber. Andrew Lloyd Webber. This is 84. And he is just pumping out musicals. And they're, they're ones that are still around today. So, by the way, Starlight Express is batshit. If you don't know. I've never seen the full show, but I do know everyone performs on roller skates. I would love to see it. So first off, the set has got to be specially designed to hold and do this. Maybe it's a custom-built theater. I don't know. But Starlight Express opens uh, in London. What had Lloyd Webber or A. Webb done before that? He'd done uh, Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat. He'd done Jesus Christ Superstar. He'd done Evita. He'd done Cats. You know, all these worldwide famous musicals. And then he went... <laughs> I don't know if... He just went batshit, just like, yeah, after the, uh, you know, the musical about cats, where everyone's just a cat, and there's no fucking story. Um, actually, there is a story, just for the longest time. I, No one could explain to me what cats was. I don't know if anyone else has had this. Like, I knew it was people dressed as cats and singing about being cats, but I was like, what is the story of cat? What the fuck happens in this musical? And people were like, oh, you know, well, you know, they're, they're jellical cats. And I'm like, what is that? That's just opened another question door for me. I don't know what that is. As far as I knew, like, it was just a parade of cats introducing themselves through song. And then something happens. Anyway, I eventually saw a YouTube video that was about why the movie Cats was so terrible. But in there, he explained the story of cats. Check that out. I'll put a link, link in the description. Or remind me to. I don't know how to do that yet. I will do it. I'll get it to you. It's a really good... It was the most succinct and perfect uh, description of the story of cats I've ever had. Anyway, so Lloyd Webber, after this fucking... He goes from, like, religious musicals. Joseph Technicolor Dreamcoat. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ Superstar. He's like, I want to make the story of the Bible, several Bible stories, musicals. And then he's like, oh, then I want to talk about Argentinian royalty in Evita. And then cats. And then they were like, hey, we're, whew, that was a bit weird. Um, oh, what do you think for the next one? He's like, I want everyone on roller skates. And at this point, who the fuck is going to say no to Andrew Lloyd Webber? No one. That's right. Starlight Express. Um, it's about a boy that has goes to sleep and dreams about trains that race. I would love to see racing trains. Like, it just comes down, like, they're all on fucking tracks, right? If you're on front, you're staying in front, I'm sure. Anyway, what else? 84. Johan Cruyff retires, the, the footballer. I remember we used to play PS2, like, one of the Pro Evolution Soccers, and Johan Cruyff was an unlockable character, and you got him, and all his stats were, like, 99. This guy was a legend, but from the 70s, I think. Some movies that released, Once Upon a Time in America. If you haven't seen that, it's Robert De Niro, James Woods... Uh, Jennifer Connelly, uh, and it's one of the best gangster films you probably would not have ever heard of. Uh, it's what they call what they, what they call like an anti-gangster film. Like all the other gangster movies of the time seem to kind of glorify being a gangster, and this one was like, actually, it's really shit. In a way, anyway, um, a little movie called The Terminator. Holy shit! What a film! I remember I got my parents to let me watch it because I was like eight or ten or something at the time and my friend paul was really into the terminator he's like you've got to watch the terminator and i was like it's r18 and i convinced my dad to let me watch it with him at the dinner table 
And I wasn't helping myself because once he said yes, I was like, awesome. Paul told me there's a scene where this guy, his whole face melts off and he's a robot skeleton underneath. And I watched it and it was fucking scary, but awesome. The Terminator. If you haven't seen it, what the fuck are you doing? You need to watch it. Um, Nightmare on Elm Street also comes out in 84. I hate horror movies. I don't watch horror movies. I take them to bed with me. I... You know when other people can just be like, oh, I watched this scary movie and now I'm done with it. And Ooh, wasn't it fun to be scared for a little bit? I can't do that. The terror stays with me all night. To the like, I can't, I can't go to the toilet because if I go to the toilet in the middle of the night, the monster from the movie will get me. I'm a grown man. And I still firmly believe this. I can't, I won't watch them. And also, wasn't the thing about this one that he kills you in your dreams? So even if you you go to sleep... Which is when you're like, oh, duh, I'm just scared until I go to sleep. Too bad. That's where they, that's where he gets you, right? Anyway, never watching it. 84, Bruce Springsteen, born in the USA, drops and sells 30 million copies. Purple Rain by Prince is released and is at number one for 24 weeks out of those two. Both, both artists whose songs I love. I've got a very eclectic mix of music. Like, I don't, I'm not a diehard, like, any band fan. I kind of tend to like one or two songs, at least from most big artists. And yes, mainstream artists. I know, like, I don't, I used to have a, my, my, my good friend and ex-flatmate Gareth was one of these guys that was really into music. And he'd always be like, oh, I'm just off to get a, go watch a gig for a band. And I'm like, who's playing? He'd be like, you wouldn't have heard of them half. There's no way you would have heard of them. They're playing in a fucking cupboard in an abandoned hall in a town no one's ever heard of okay but they're up and coming all right so yeah i like mainstream music fucking shoot me um what's love got to do with it is released i think this is tina turner's first big hit i went to go watch the tina turner musical in london the bio musical biopic bio show bio show um my wife said it twice she took me for the second time her second time my first time and it was awesome it is really good. Like, Tina Turner has got an amazing vocal, and the girl who plays Tina Turner fucking nails it. We've got a friend coming later this year, and I think my wife is, is trying to get her to go watch Tina Turner, the show again, for my wife's third time. So if you're thinking about watching it, talk to my wife. She will tell you you need to watch it three fucking times. Anyway, what's love got to do with it? In this show, you find out that it was a song written for her, and the original composition was this really slow ballady kind of thing. And it was like, yeah, they show, they play a little bit of what it was supposed to sound like. And you're like, yeah, that sounds like shit. I'm glad they changed it. Uh, Tetris is released in 84. Tetris, what a fucking game. I've just got my daughter starting to play Tetris and she loves it. This game is 40 years old. And it, its beauty lies in its simplicity. Um... If you don't know about Tetris, it was made... You know about Tetris, the shapes game. Anyway, um, it was made in the Soviet Union by a guy called Alexei Pajitnov. I definitely said that wrong. Alexei Pajitnov. And because it was made in the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union state took it and said, uh, this is ours. Uh, no money for you. And then there was a whole bunch of complications about the rights and within the fall of the Soviet Union and everything like that. Apparently there's a movie out about it called Tetris. It's got Taron Egerton, and I hope it's the first video game movie that doesn't suck. And I think it's because it's about the story of Tetris getting out of the Soviet Union into the hands of Americans where it could experience freedom. Uh, luckily, it's not all bad for Alexei. He did start getting money from it in 1996. And if he's still getting royalties on it, I'm sure he's a fucking millionaire. And he deserves to be. Does everyone play Tetris the same way? We just kind of like build up all the blocks and wait for the big long skinny one and get that sweet, sweet four lines gone in one go. It's good. Tetris is amazing. I will take your Tetris and raise you Mean Bean Machine on uh, Mega Drive or Genesis, depending on where you grow up. Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine is essentially Tetris on steroids. And you play it two player. And oh, when you do good moves, it, it uh, penalizes or it... it puts up an obstacle for the other player it's fucking great if you like tetris and you wanted to like if you ever like playing can i play tetris but with a friend and really send big fuck yous their way every 30 seconds yes this is the game for you um 
oh, I just came across this. I never do kind of, I don't want to get into anything political on this. But apparently in 84, there was a failed coup in Bolivia by a group of cocaine growers, which is the most cocaine thing to ever happen. <laughs> I can just imagine all just having lines and going like, yeah, yeah, we'd do a better job in the government, wouldn't we? Yeah, we should take over the government. Yeah, we totally should. And then they go to do it. And then everyone's like, oh, my God, I am so high. I can't do this. Um, 84, Careless Whisper is released by uh, George Michael, Wham, slash Wham. Um, Careless Whisper, you might not recognize the name, but you'll recognize the song. It's the one with the saxophone, anytime anyone wants to make something sexy, and it goes... But with the saxophone, instead of my horrendous tongue noises. Ugh, what a creepy phrase, my horrendous tongue noises. Anyway, this song, um, I'm sure they did it, you know, with all the sincerity of what they wanted to do, but it became every sketch's go-to. You can make anything sexy and funny. It was just overused so much that it became a trope and used in sketches so much. Any piece of film, pause and start playing Careless Whisper. <laughs> Eating a sandwich, stop and look up and... <laughs> so sexy, but kind of funny at the same time. Anything. Getting arrested. Wiping your ass. Try it. Film something. Chuck Careless Whisper over the top of it. It's very fun. Uh, what else? Jeopardy debuts. We didn't get Jeopardy in New Zealand. I know it was a huge uh, quiz show, game show in the US. What we, um, what Gareth and I, my flatmate, we used to love watching was um, the SNL Celebrity Jeopardy sketches. And, oh, they were fucking great. We like we used to have to download them. Where did we get them from? Like, this wasn't, this was in the days before you could just go on YouTube and search for whatever the fuck you want. Which is amazing, by the way. You can pretty much be on YouTube. Um, there was a little clip from a show uh, 36 years ago. Has anyone seen it? And YouTube's like, yeah, I got you. Yeah, here it is. Whoever is out there uploading these obscure clips, these old commercials, these intros of TV shows that have long been being cancelled... You're doing the Lord's work. Thank you to whoever is out there doing that. Keep up the good work. You are just filling us all up to the brim on a, a nostalgia quota. So thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, Jeopardy was a famous one you had to answer in the form of a question. And it was just so thinly veiled. What What is Lake Titicaca? Ugh. I wanted to see like Jeopardy for experts. Like answer in the form of a riddle. Or answer in the form of a limerick. I'd sit down and watch that. Those people deserve that fucking money. Uh, 84. Miami Vice debuts. Uh, the Cosby Show debuts. By the way, there was a time when we didn't realise that Bill Cosby was a monster. And w my family loved watching The Cosby Show. Alright? We were allowed to back then. We had no reason not to think it was wholesome as fuck. Okay, of course you can never watch an episode now, knowing what we know, but there was a time back then that we would watch it and my dad would laugh so hard at it. And my mum too. And there's just something about, um, I don't, I don't remember a lot of things that would make dad laugh. So whenever dad would laugh, and like, I don't mean really laugh, his whole body would shake. He did this really, my dad was like a strict, serious man, but he had this laugh that he would do, which was kind of like between his teeth. And his tongue would like his tongue's in, in his teeth, and he just make this like <laughs> kind of ridiculous laugh. And you were like, it was so ridiculous looking at him and this noise coming out of his mouth, and just be like, yeah, he's not faking that laugh. It would make all us laugh. And anyway, those were good times. Shame on you, Bill Cosby. You've tainted those fucking memories for me. Uh, Do they know it's Christmas? By Band Aid is dropped uh, for Africa. For Africa, right? They did it for Africa. Do they know it's Christmas time? Well, there's a lot of Muslim countries in Africa, so they probably don't give a shit. Uh, like a Virgin drops as well. By Madonna. Like a Virgin. Like a Virgin always makes me think of um, the opening scene of Reservoir Dogs. And that opening scene is so Tarantino. Like, this is Tarantino raw before he started like really finding his feet. This is clearly... Tarantino smoking a joint, writing his first script and going, oh yeah, and then they say this. 
and it's got Steve Buscemi talking about like how, no guys, no, I'm going to do my terrible Steve Buscemi. No, no. Like a virgin is about a, a girl who wants to be fucked so hard. It's like she's being fucked like a virgin again. That's my Steve Buscemi. It was awful. <laughs> but you can see it's it's so Tarantino. Him just, you can tell he's kind of getting horny off his own words in a really weird way. Like Tarantino was so lucky. He was not just laughed out of Hollywood for just going like, man, you're creepy. Take your script about feet and fuck off. You know? All right. Um, it's time for the wrap up of 84. We're going to look at the top five uh, movies, video games and songs. And also Times Person of the Year for 1984. Times Person of the Year for 1984 was Peter Uberoff. I'm saying that wrong. I know. Peter Uberoff. Uh, who was he? He was the head of the Olympic Committee for the 1984 Olympic Games in Los Angeles. He organized the Olympics in Los Angeles. Which when you think about it. That is a huge feat. My God. I mean, if you've ever tried to organize a get-together, try organizing five friends to get together. It's a shit fit, right? Try getting 140 countries for a get-together, all right? In LA traffic as well, that guy deserves a Nobel fucking whatever prize they give out for this sort of thing. <sighs> Oh, we went to the 1984 Olympics. There's a picture somewhere of my family in front of somewhere at the 84 Olympics. And we're dressed like a, a dressed like we've been shoved into witness protection and we've been given tourist disguises. Like we were wearing like Olympic, you know, Olympics merch. My dad's got the tiny, tiny short shorts on. My mum's got like that visor on. I'm wearing, what am I wearing? Like, I don't know olympic something it looked very much and my dad's wearing a cap for some reason and he's i don't know how many times i wore a cap in his life he cannot wear it i don't know how you can wear a cap wrong but it's kind of like sitting on top of his hair but nowhere near actually being on his head i don't know we clearly look like take a photo for the fbi to make it look like you're on the run or something it's really bad all right so that was the person of the year peter uber thank you for organizing the 84 olympic games well done, I'm sure. If I'd organized the Olympic Games afterwards, I'd be like, I'm taking the rest of my life off. No one fucking bother me. I'm taking no calls. All right, what should we start with? with should we start with top five video games? Um, by the way, I'm finding it very hard to find a definitive list for video games. Like with movies and songs, I can find uh, like Billboard and, um, uh, you know, statistics sites that will actually tell you what the movies are and what they're gross and stuff. The video games, I'm finding it a bit hard, so I've had to piece this one together. Because I think around that time, especially, there's so much things like there's arcade games versus home console games. And in the home console market, you're looking at like US release versus Japan releases. And some games were released in Japan, some weren't here. So this is as best as I can compile for uh, 84 here. At number five, Elevator Action. I played that as a kid. It was actually really fun. Bunch of elevators around, you wandering around trying to shoot other people, and they can get on elevators, and you can get on elevators. Oh, it was loads of fun. Uh, number four, Punch Out. Punch Out. I remember playing Super Punch Out on a plane, and I didn't get past the first round. I didn't get into the first fight, because I think the first guy you fought was a guy called Gabby Joe, who was like this geriatric, you know, old guy. And he comes out there, and he goes, yay! And I just started laughing my ass off, because I'm like, this game was expecting me to beat the shit out of some grandpa yeah, that's the most I've played of, of any sort of punch out. So punch out one uh, was number four. Number three, pole position two. That's in there from last year, I think. Is it? I don't know. Pole position two. Number two is track and field. I'm guessing the 1984 Olympics would have given that a huge boost. Because this is the first time they would have had an Olympics with home consoles kind of getting out to the market. And they would have gone like, oh, we can do this. We can do We can sell a video game based on the Olympics. People will eat it up as clearly they did. Do you remember every year after that, there would always be some bullshit crap game on the Olympics? Barcelona 92, the game, catch it. No thanks. Uh, number one, pole position. Yeah, this was weird. Number three was pole position two, and number one was pole position on this list. Well done, pole position. You bit out your predecessor. Uh, your s successor. There we go. Um, right, top five songs. According to Billboard magazine, so this is quantified, uh, number five, Against All Odds. Take a look at me now. Phil Collins, banger of a track. Fantastic. 
Number four, Footloose by Kenny Loggins. Kenny Loggins also did um, Highway to the Danger Zone for Top Gun. He would have been raking it in in the 80s. Footloose, um, I was never a huge fan of Footloose. I think it was overplayed. I don't know. And it always made your parents kind of dance. And I don't know, that was never fun to watch. Uh, number three, Say, Say, Say by Paul McCartney and Michael Jackson. I'd never heard of this song. I went to go listen to it, um, thinking I'd be like, oh, I know this song because it's Paul McCartney and Michael Jackson. I know they did another collaboration. You know, the girl is mine. The girl is mine, mine, mine. That one. <clears throat> but um, I'd never heard of Say, Say, Say. And the music video has them kind of in old time, old timey America going around and uh, what do you call it? Scamming people. Like they play the whole thing of like, oh, I'm selling something. And Michael Jackson pops up, who's a stranger from the crowd. He's like, I'll try some of that. And, oh, this magical elixir does wonders. And then Paul McCartney packs up shop, gets on a pickup truck, picks up Michael Jackson out of town. And then they move on to the next one to go carry on their, their shenanigans. Um, number two, What's Love Got to Do With It? Tina Turner. Very nice. And number one, When Doves Cry by Prince. The original was great, wasn't it? This is what it sounds like when it does cry. Bam, bam, bam. When Prince died, I remember I went to an improv night that night. Um, and one of the guys there, a guy called Keith, was just so sad that Prince had died. And I felt like going, um, he just kept, was so, so down about it. And I was like, okay, let's do some improv. He's like, I don't know if I can do improv. If, you know, Prince is dead. What am I doing? And eventually I was like, come on, man. How much did Prince really mean to you? And he lifted up his arm and he had like a Prince tattoo. And I was like, oh, okay, okay, there enough, there it is. All right, top five movies. This is worldwide, by the way. I managed to get it to go to worldwide rather than just US box office. Top five movies worldwide and 84. Karate Kid is number five. Karate Kid, what a film. By the way, um, I'm going to say it. It's controversial. The Karate Kid wasn't very good at karate. Like, actually, the karate in these movies is kind of shit. Like, um, and I think I can speak for a little bit of experience. I did karate for about 15 years, and this became my pet peeve, seeing shitty martial arts in movies. Uh, and, you know, as a kid, I was like, yay, karate! And you go back and watch it now, you're like, oh my god, the, oh, this is not convincing at all. Like, Daniel should not have won in this tournament at all. It was an illegal kick to the face, surely. Uh, and also, fun fact, Pat Morita, the guy that played Mr. Miyagi, you know, with thick Japanese accent that people would be like, oh, I'm not sure about that these days. Um, he was a fluent uh, English speaker. He was an American stand-up comedian. So he was like, hey, I'm Pat Morita. And then he, when he went to filming, he was like, Miyagi. <laughs> it just would have been weird seeing him on set. Hey, morning, Pat. Morning. You catch that traffic this morning? Yeah, sure did. Ready to film? Yeah. Hey. What an actor, I guess you could say. Anyway, number four, Gremlins. Um, great Christmas movie. Um, Gremlins, classic. I feel like I was going to go down a whole rant about Gremlins, but shit, you've seen it. You've seen it, and my voice is starting to give out, and I feel like I've been rambling for a long time. Uh, number three, Temple of Doom. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Uh, I mean, for a while, it was the weakest Indiana Jones movie, and then they made more. Um... You know Temple of Doom, uh, and his sidekick in that one was uh, the, the dude who won the Oscar from Everything Every, Everywhere All at Once, Kei He Huang. Oh God, I've I fucked it, but I'm not looking it up. You know that he was a kid when that came out, and he was the sidekick. When Lord of the Rings came out years later, someone told me that uh, we were talking about the cast, and someone told me that Gimli the dwarf was going to be played by Indiana Jones's sidekick. And they were talking about John Rhys Davies from the first movie, and I was thinking they were talking about this kid from the in, from the Temple of Doom. And when I saw Lord of the Rings the first time, I saw the door, and I was like, "Holy shit, that, that Asian kid looks so different!" Oh. And then I realized what was happening. I'm an idiot. Uh, number two was Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters is like The Princess Bride, where when you watch it as a kid, you're just like, this is an awesome action movie. These guys have lasers on their backs, and they're going around busting ghosts in a cool car, in cool jumpsuits. And you watch it as an adult, and you're like, this is so fucking funny. Like, that famous, it's true. 
this man has no dick. Oh, like The Princess Bride, the first time you watch it, Princess Bride is amazing swashbuckling action movie, and you watch it again, it's a comedy. Ghostbusters cannot say enough about it. So good. And number one that year, Beverly Hills Cop. Uh, confession, I've never watched Beverly Hills Cop. Never seen it. I know the theme tune. Uh, I've seen bits of it here and there. I know Judge Reinhold's in it, being all Judge Reinhold in it. And Eddie Murphy, I know it was his big breakout star ring role. That's why did that say yeah, star ring roll? Yeah, Eddie Murphy killed it in it. Everyone loved it. There was Beverly Hills Cop 2, 3, and all my friends at school were like, Beverly Hills Cop is amazing. Never watched it. Never watched it, and I don't think I ever have a reason to watch it. Sure, should I? I don't know. Maybe some of you right now go, you think you like movies, and you say, you've never watched Beverly Hills Cop. You're a fucking fraud. Javier Hakeem, you're a fucking fraud. That I am. Um, personally, what was happening with me, I was two, like I mentioned at the start. I don't remember much. I think we were still, ah, uh, had we moved to Florida? Maybe we moved from Costa Rica to Florida at this point. I have to check. But then, you know, this is so fuzzy for me. And it wasn't on me to have travel plans. I was two years old. I was just existing and starting to... I t- I'll tell you what I was doing. I was learning Spanish from my parents, uh, but English from, if we were in Florida, from everyone around me. So the funny thing is, I don't actually know what I learned first. Like Spanish or English. I'd say Spanish from your parents. But you have no idea how much the world around you influences your language as well. Like, my parents only spoke to me in Spanish, ever. And then my English got so much better because I grew up in an English-speaking country in New Zealand. Anyway, more about that another time. Uh, Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. Uh, I'm really enjoying going back and seeing what was happening in these years. Um, If you like it, recommend it, share it. I don't know, leave it a rating. That helps me out a lot. I, you know, this is just one of those casual podcasts. You're not. I don't think you're going to learn anything here. And if you did, that's a bonus. That ain't. That ain't me. All right, that's you piecing things together and well done you. Uh, Thank you so much for being here. I will catch you next time with 1985. I'll catch you around. Be good. Take care. See you later. Bye.